This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The 930 Up Train by S. Baring Gould. Recorded by Adrian Pretzelis. In a well authenticated ghost story, names and dates should be distinctly specified. In the following story I am unfortunately able to give only the year and the month, for I have forgotten the date of the day, and I don't keep a diary. With regard to names, my own figures as a guarantee that of the principal personage to whom the following extraordinary circumstances occurred, but the minor actors are provided with fictitious names, for I am not warranted to make their real ones public. I may add that the believer in ghosts may make use of the facts which I relate to establish his theory, if he finds that they will be of service to him when he has read through and weighed well the startling account which I am about to give from my own experiences. On a fine evening in June 1860, I paid a visit to Mrs. Lyons on my way to the Hassocks Gate station on the London and Brighton line. This station is the first out of Brighton. As I rode to leave, I mentioned to the lady whom I was visiting that I expected a parcel of books from town, and that I was going to the station to inquire whether it had arrived. Oh, she said readily, I expect Dr. Lyons out from Brighton by the 9.30 train. If you like to drive the pony chaise down and meet him, you are welcome, and you can bring your parcel back with you in it. I gladly accepted her offer, and in a few minutes I was seated in a little low basket carriage drawn by a pretty iron-grey Welsh pony. The station road commands the line of the South Downs from Chantonbury Ring, with its cap of dark firs, to Mount Harry, the scene of the memorable Battle of Lewis. Wolfsonbury stands out like a headland above the dark Danny woods, over which the rooks were wheeling and cawing previous to settling themselves in for the night. Ditchling Beacon, its steep sides gashed with chalk pits, was faintly flushed with light. The Clayton windmills, with their sails motionless, stood out darkly against the green evening sky. Close beneath opens the tunnel in which not so long before had happened one of the most fearful railway accidents on record. The evening was exquisite. The sky was kindled with light, though the sun was set. A few gilded bars of cloud lay in the west. Two or three stars looked forth. One, I noticed, twinkling green, crimson, and gold, like a gem. From a field of young wheat hard by, I heard the harsh, grating note of the corn crake. Mist was lying on the low meadows like a mantle of snow, pure, smooth, and white. The cattle stood in it to their knees. The effect was so singular that I drew up to look at it attentively. At the same moment I heard the scream of an engine, and on looking toward the downs I noted the up-train shooting out of the tunnel, its red signal lamps flashing brightly out of the purple gloom which bathed the roots of the hills. Seeing that I was late, I whipped the Welsh pony on and proceeded at a fast trot. About a quarter of a mile from the station there is a turnpike. An odd-looking building, tenanted by a strange old man, usually dressed in a white smock, over which his long white beard flowed to his chest. This toll collector, he is dead now, had amused himself in bygone days by carving life-size heads out of wood and these were stuck along the eaves. One is the face of a drunkard, round and blotched, leering out of misty eyes at the passers-by. The next has the crumpled features of a miser, worn out with toil and moil. The third has the wild scowl of a maniac, and the fourth the stare of an idiot. I drove past, flinging the toll at the door and shouting to the old man to pick it up for I was in a vast hurry to reach the station before Dr. Lyons left it. 
I whipped the little pony on, and he began to trot down a cutting in the green sand through which leads the station road. Suddenly Taffy stood still, planted his feet resolutely on the ground, threw up his head, snorted, and refused to move a peg. I gee-upped and chushed, but all to no purpose, not a step with the little fellow advance. I saw that he was thoroughly alarmed. His flanks were quivering and his ears were thrown back. I was on the point of leaving the chaise when the pony made a bound to one side and ran the carriage up into the hedge, thereby upsetting me on the road. I picked myself up and took the beast's head. I could not conceive what had frightened him. There was positively nothing to be seen, except a puff of dust running up the road, as such might be blown along by a passing current of air. There was nothing to be heard, except the rattle of a gig or a tax cart, with one wheel loose. Probably a vehicle of this kind was being driven down the London road, which branches off at the turnpike at right angles. The sound became fainter, and at last died away in the distance. The pony now refused to advance. It trembled violently, and was covered with sweat. Well, upon my word, you have been driving hard, exclaimed Dr. Lyons, when I met him at the stations. I have not indeed, was my reply, but something has frightened Taffy, but what that something was is more than I can tell. Well, ah, said the doctor, looking round with a certain degree of interest in his face, so you met it, did you? Met what? Oh, nothing, only I've heard of horses being frightened along this road after the arrival of the 9.30 up train. Flies never leave the moment the train comes in, or horses become restive. A wonderful thing for a fly-horse to become restive, isn't it? But what causes the alarm? I saw nothing. Ha! Huh, you ask me more than I can answer. I am as ignorant as the cause as yourself. I take things as they stand and make no inquiries. When the flyman tells me that he can't start for a minute or two after the train has arrived, or urges his horses to reach the station before the arrival of this train, giving as his reason that his brutes become wild if he does not do so, well, then I merely say, do as you think best, cabby, and I bother my head no more about the matter. I shall search this matter out, said I resolutely. What has taken place so strangely corroborates the superstition that I shall leave it not uninvestigated. Take my advice, and banish it from your thoughts. When you have come to the end you will be sadly disappointed, and will find that all the mystery evaporates, and leaves a dull commonplace residuum. It is best that the few mysteries that remain to us unexplained should remain mysteries, or we shall disbelieve in supernatural agencies altogether. We have searched out the arcana of nature, and ex exposed all her secrets to the garish eye of day, and we find in despair that the poetry and the romance of life are gone. Are we the happier for knowing that there are no ghosts, no fairies, no witches, no mermaids, no wood spirits? Were not our forefathers happier in thinking every lake to be the abode of a fairy, every forest to be the bower of a yellow-haired sylph, every moorland sweep to be tripped over by elf and pixie? I found my little boy, one day lying on his face in a fairy ring, crying, Oh, oh dear, dear little fairies, I will believe in you, though papa says you are all nonsense. I used in my childish days to think, when a silence fell upon a company, that an angel was passing through the room. Alas! I now know that it results only from the subject of weather having been talked to death, and no new subject having been started. Believe me, science has done good to mankind, but it has done mischief too. If we wish to be poetical or romantic, we must shut our eyes to facts. The head and the heart wage mutual war now. A lover preserves a lock of his mistress's hair as a holy relic. Yet he must know perfectly well that for all practical purposes 
A bit of rhinoceros hide would do as well. The chemical constituents are identical. If I adore a fair lady and feel the thrill through all my veins when I touch her hand, a moment's consideration tells me that a phosphate of lime number one is a touching phosphate of lime number two, nothing more. If for a moment I forget myself so far as to wave my cap and cheer for king or queen or prince, I laugh at my folly next moment for having paid reverence to one disgusting machine over another. I cut the doctor short, as he was lapsing into his favourite subject of discussion, and asked him whether he would lend me the pony-chaise on the following evening that I might drive to the station again, and try to unravel the mystery. "'I will lend you the pony,' said he, "'but not the chaise, as I am afraid of it being injured, should Taffy take fright and run up into the hedge again. I've got a saddle.' Next evening I was on my way to the station, considerably before the time at which the train was due. I stopped at the turnpike, and chatted with the old man who kept it. I asked him whether he could throw any light upon the matter which I was investigating. He shrugged his shoulders, saying that he know nothing about it at all. What, nothing at all? I don't trouble my head with matters of this sort, was the reply. People do say that something out of the common passes along the road, and turns down the other road leading to Clayton and Brighton. But I pays no attention to what them people says. Do you ever hear anything? After the arrival of the 9.30 train, I does at times hear the rattle as of a mail cart, and the trot of a horse along the road, and the sound of it is as though one of the wheels is loose. I've been out many a time to take the toll, but, law bless ye, them spirits, if spirits them be, don't go for a pay toll. Have you never inquired into the matter? Why should I? Anything as don't go for a pay toll don't concern me. Do ye think that I know how many people and dogs go through this here gate in a day? Not I. Them don't pay toll, so them's no odds to me. Look here, my man, said I, do you object to my putting the bar across the road immediately upon the arrival of the train? Not a bit, please your sal, but you don't have much time to lose, for there comes Dicky train out of Clayton Tunnel. I shut the gate, mounted Taffy, and drew up across the road a little way below the turnpike. I heard the train arrive, I saw it puff off. At the same moment I distinctly heard a trap coming up the road, one of the real wheels rattling as though it were loose. I repeat deliberately that I heard it. I cannot account for it, though I heard it, yet I saw nothing whatsoever. At the same time the pony became restless. It tossed its head, pricked up its ears, it started, pranced, then made a bound to one side entirely regardless of whip and rein, it tried to scramble up the sandbank in its alarm, and I had to throw myself off and catch its head. I then cast a glance behind me at the turnpike. I saw the bar bent, as though someone were passing against it, and then, with a click, it flew open and was dashed violently back against the white post to which it was usually hasped in the daytime. There it remained, quivering from the shock. Immediately I heard the rattle, rattle, rattle of the tax cart. I confess that my first impulse was to laugh. The idea of a ghostly tax cart was so essentially ludicrous. But the reality of the whole scene soon brought me to a graver mood, and remounting Taffy, I rode down to the station. The officials were taking their ease, as another train was not due for some while. So I stepped up to the station-master, and entered into conversation with him. After a few desultory remarks, I mentioned the circumstances which had occurred to me on the road, and my ability to account for them. "'So that's what you're after,' said the master, somewhat bluntly. "'Well, I can tell you nothing about it.' 
Spirits don't come in my way, saving and excepting those which can be taken inwardly. A mighty comforted warming things they be when they so taken. So you ask me about other sorts of spirits? I tell you flatly I don't believe in them, though I don't mind drinking the health of them what does. Perhaps you may have the chance, if you are a little more communicative, said I. Well, I'll tell you all I know, and that's precious little, answered the worthy man. I know one thing for certain, that one compartment of a second-class carriage is always left vacant between Brighton and Hassock's Gate by the 9.30 up train. For what purpose? Ah, that's more than I can fully explain. Before the orders came to this effect, people went into fits and like that in one of their carriages. Any particular carriage? The first compartment of the second-class carriage nearest the engine. It is locked at Brighton, and I unlock it at this station. What do you mean by saying that people had fits? I mean that I used to find men and women a-screeching and a-hollering like mad to be let out. They'd seen some that had frightened them as they were passing through the Clayton Tunnel. That was before they made the arrangement I told you of. Very strange, I said meditatively. Very much so. But true for all that, I don't believe in nothing but spirits of a warming and a cheering nature. Them and saw ain't found in Clayton Tunnel to my thinking. There was evidently nothing more to be got out of my friend. I hope that he drank my health that night. If he omitted to do so, it was his fault, not mine. As I rode home, revolving in my mind all that I had heard and seen, I became more and more settled in my determination to thoroughly investigate the matter. The best means that I could adopt for so doing would be to come out from Brighton by the 9.30 train in the very compartment of the second-class carriage from which the public were considerately excluded. Somehow I felt no shrinking from the attempt. My curiosity was so intense that it overcame all apprehension as to the consequences. My next free day was Thursday, and I had hoped to execute my plan. In this, however, I was disappointed, as I found that a battalion drill was fixed for that very evening, and I was desirous of attending it, being somewhat behindhand in the regulation number of drills. I was consequently obliged to postpone my Brighton trip. On the Thursday evening, about five o'clock, I started in regimentals with my rifle over my shoulder for the drilling ground, a piece of furzy common near the railway station. I was speedily overtaken by Mr. Ball, a corporal in the Rifle Corps, a capital shot, and a most efficient in his drill. Mr. Ball was driving his gig. He stopped on seeing me and offered me a seat beside him. I gladly accepted, as the distance to the station is a mile and three-quarters by the road and two miles by what is commonly supposed to be the short cart across the fields. After some conversation on volunteering matters, about which Corporal Ball was an enthusiast, we turned out of the lanes into the station road, and I took the opportunity of averting to the subject which was uppermost to my mind. Oh, I've heard a great deal about that, said the Corporal. My workman often told me some cock and bull story of that kind. I can't say how as I believe him. What you tell me is, however, very remarkable. I never had it on such good authority afore. Still, I can't believe that there's anything supernatural about it. I don't yet know what to believe, I replied, for the whole matter is to me perfectly inexplicable. You know, of course, the story which gave rise to the superstition. Not I. Pray tell it to me. Hmm. Just about seven years are gone. Why, you must remember the circumstances as well as I do. There was a man drove from, I can't say where, for it never was actually ascertained, but from the Hemfield direction, in a light cart. He went to the station inn, throwing the reins to John Thomas the ostler, bade him to take up the track and bring it around to meet the 9.30 train, by which he calculated to return from Brighton. John Thomas said how the stranger was quite unbeknown to him, and that he looked as though he had had some matter on his mind when he went up to the train. He was a queer sort of a chap, with thick grey hair and a beard, 
and delicate white hands, just like a lady's. The trap was round to the station door as he ordered by the arrival of the 9.30 train. The ostler observed then that the man was ashen pale, and that his hands trembled as he took the reins, that the stranger stared at him in a wild, abstracted way, and that he would have driven off without tendering payment had he not been respectfully reminded that the horse had been given a feed of hoats. John Thomas made an observation to the gent relative to the wheel which was loose, but that observation meant with no corresponding answer. The driver whipped his horse and went off. He passed the turnpike and was seen to take the Brighton road instead of that by which he had come. A workman observed the trap next on the downs above Clayton chalk pits. He didn't pay much attention to it, but he said the driver was on his legs at the head of the horse. Next morning, when the quarrymen went to the pit, they found a shattered tax cart at the bottom, and the horse and driver dead, the latter with his neck broken. What was curious, too, was that an handkerchief was bound round the brute's eyes, so that he must have driven over the edge blindfolded. Hard, wasn't it? Well, folks say the gent and his tax cart passes along that road every evening after the arrival of the 9.30 train. I don't believe it. I ain't a bit superstitious, not I. Next week I was again disappointed in my expectation of being able to put my scheme into execution. But on the third Saturday after my conversation with Corporal Ball, I walked into Brighton in the afternoon, a distance being about nine miles. I spent an hour on the shore watching the boats, and then I sauntered around the pavilion, ardently longing that fire might break forth and consume that architectural monstrosity. I believe that I afterwards had a cup of coffee at the refreshment rooms at the station and capital refreshment rooms they are, or were, very moderate and very good. I think I partook of a bun, and if I put my oath I could not swear to the fact. A floating reminiscence of bun lingers in the chamber of memory, but I cannot be positive, and I wish this paper to advance nothing but reliable facts. I squandered precious time in reading the advertisements of baby jumpers which no mother should be without, which are indispensable in the nursery, and the greatest acquisition in the parlour, the greatest discovery of modern times, etc., etc. I perused the notice of the advantage of metallic brushes, and admired the young lady with her hair white on one side and black on the other. I studied the Chinese letter commentary of Horniman's Tea and the inferior English translation, and counted up the number of agents in Great Britain in Ireland. In length the ticket office opened, and I booked for Hassett's Gate, second class, fare, one shilling. I ran along the platform till I came to the compartment of the second class carriage which I wanted. The door was locked, so I shouted for a guard. Put me in here, please. Can't there, sir. Next, please. Empty one woman and a baby. I particularly wish to enter this carriage, said I. Can't be. Locked. Orders. Company, replied the guard, turning on his heel. What reason is there for the public being excluded, may I ask? Dunno. Express orders. Can't let you in. Next carriage, please. Now then, quick, please. I knew the guard, and he knew me by sight, for I often travelled to and fro on the line, so I thought it best to be candid with him. I briefly told him my reason for making the request, and begged him to assist me in executing my plan. He then consented, although with reluctance. "'Have it your own way,' he said. "'Only if anything happens, don't blame me.' "'Never fear,' laughed I, jumping into the carriage. The guard left the carriage unlocked, and in two minutes we were off. I did not feel in the slightest degree nervous. There was no light in the carriage, but that did not matter, as there was twilight. I sat facing the engine on the left side, 
and every now and then I looked out at the downs with the soft haze of light still hanging over them. We swept into a cutting, and I watched the lines of flint in the chalk, and longed to be geologizing among them with my hammer, picking out shepherd's crowns and shark's teeth, the delicate riconella and the quaint viniculite. I remembered a not very distant occasion on which I had actually ventured there, and been chased off by the guard, having brought down an avalanche of chalk debris in a manner dangerous to traffic, while endeavouring to extricate a magnificent ammonite which I had found and, alas, left protruding from the side of the cutting. I wondered whether that ammonite was still there. I looked about to identify the exact spot as we whizzed along, and at that moment we shot into the tunnel. I cannot explain how it was that now, all of a sudden, a feeling of terror came over me. It seemed to drop over me like a wet sheet, and wrap me round and round. I felt that someone was seated opposite me, someone in the darkness with his eyes fixed on me. Many persons possessed of keen nervous sensibility are well aware when they are in the presence of another, even though they can see no one, and I believe that I possess this power strongly. If I were blindfolded, I think I should know when any one was looking fixedly at me, and I am certain that I should instinctively know that I was not alone if I entered a dark room into which another person was seated, even though he made no noise. I remember a college friend of mine who dabbled in anatomy, telling me that a little Italian violinist once called upon him to give him a lesson on that instrument. The foreigner, a singularly nervous individual, moved restlessly from the place where he had been standing, casting many a furtive glance over his shoulder at a press which was behind him. At last the little fellow tossed aside his violin, saying, I cannot give the lesson if someone will look at me from behind. There's somebody in the cupboard I know. You're right, there is, laughed my anatomical friend, flinging open the door of the press and discovering a skeleton. The horror which possessed me was numbing. For a few moments I could neither lift my hands nor store a finger. I was tongue-tied. I seemed paralyzed in every member. I fancied that I felt eyes staring at me through the glue. A cold breath seemed to play over my face. I believed that fingers touched my chest and plucked at my coat. I drew back against the partition. My heart stood still. My flesh became stiff. My muscles rigid. I do not know whether I breathed. A blue mist swam before my eyes and my head span. The rattle and roar of the train dashing through the tunnel drowned out every other sound. Suddenly we rushed past a light fixed against the wall in the side, and it sent a flash instantaneous as that of lightning through the carriage. At that moment I saw what I shall never, never forget. I saw a face opposite me, livid as that of a corpse, hideous with passion like that of a gorilla. I cannot describe it accurately, for I saw it but for a second. Yet there rises before me now, as I write, the low, broad brow seamed with wrinkles, the shaggy, overhanging grey eyebrows, the wild, ashen eyes which glared as those of a demoniac, the coarse mouth with its fleshy lips compressed till they were white, the profusion of wolf-grey hair about the cheeks and the chin, the thin, bloodless hands, raised and half open, extended toward me as though they would clutch and tear me. In the madness of terror, I flung myself along the seat to the further window. Then I felt it moving slowly down, 
and was opposite me again. I lifted my hand to let down the window, and I touched something. I thought it was a hand. Yes, yes, it was a hand, for it folded over mine and began to contract on it. I felt each finger separately. They were cold, dully cold. I wrenched my hand away. I slipped back to my former place in the carriage by the open window, and, in frantic horror, I opened the door, clinging to it with both hands around the window jam, swinging myself out with my feet on the floor, and my head turned from the carriage. If the cold fingers had but touched my woven hands, mine would have given way. Had I but turned my head and seen that hellish countenance peering out at me, I must have lost my hole. Ah, I saw the light from the tunnel mouth. It smote upon my face. The engine rushed out with a piercing whistle. The roaring echoes of the tunnel died away. The cool, fresh breeze blew over my face and tossed my hair. The speed of the train was relaxed. The lights of the station became brighter. I heard the bell ringing loudly. I saw people waiting for the train. I felt the vibration as the brake was put on. We stopped, and then my fingers gave way. I dropped as a sack on the platform. And then, then, not till then, I awoke. There now, from beginning to end, the whole thing had been a frightful dream, caused by my having too many blankets over my bed. Ha! Ah! If I must have penned a moral, don't sleep too hot. End of The 9.30 Up Train by S. Baring Gould